Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Gates Presbyterian Church on this first Sunday of Advent. As you can see, the spirit has made its way into the sanctuary. So, and thank you to those folks yesterday that helped put all these decorations up so far. So, as I say, it takes a, a lot of hands to do God's work, and yesterday we got it done. So, I'm Eric Vale, and I'm happy to be worshiping with you this morning, both here in the sanctuary and at home, or wherever you're watching online. Unfortunately, Pastor Laura has recently been tested positive for COVID, so Laura won't be here this morning in worship, but she has recorded her sermon and will uh, be able to look and listen at that later on in our service today. So please keep Pastor Laura in your prayers today and with the idea that she will be back with us hopefully real soon. So whether you've been here your whole life or this is the first time worshiping with us at Gates Presbyterian Church, we're glad you found your way to worship this morning. A few ways you can learn more about GPC is to check out the ways we are church together through worship, fellowship, mission, and learning opportunities. Your bulletin has a calendar and a list of announcements in it, so please take time to look those over. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask somebody around you. Or this morning, our elder greeter is Barb Snaith, and Barb is over here. So if you have anything, please feel free to share with Barb this morning. Following worship this morning, please find your way down to the fellowship hall as we'll be gathering for time of fellowship, conversation, coffee, and the best cookies in the country. Uh, we do have a few announcements this morning. Um, I think I'll leave this one. I think it might, might be your, your thunder there, Roy. Next Sunday is uh, Advent Festival. People are asked to come next Sunday and enjoy the festival as there will be vendors with goods and things to look over and to purchase. And also next Sunday, we will finish the decorations here in the sanctuary. So if you have time after worship next Sunday, please stick around, enjoy the Advent Festival, and lend a hand here in the sanctuary as we get ready for Christmas. Also, we are still receiving giving intention cards. It is not too late to submit your 2023 pledges and time and talent forms, which can be done either online, on the GPC website, or you can complete your pledge card and your time and talent sheets. You can put them in the collection offering plates on, at the communion table, or you can mail them into the uh, church office as you wish. Now, Roy, please. Thank you. Next Sunday is going to be a big week. Uh, we've moved our, our Music Sunday, which is usually mid-November, to next week uh, for a number of reasons. So next week the choir has something up its sleeve for all of you. Congregational participation is required. We can't make it happen without you here. So uh, we'll see you next week for Music Sunday. Please come ready to sing. Have your tea beforehand. Good morning. I'm Linda Beatty, and I'm here for the from the hospitality team uh, for the parking lot valets or those who would like to join the parking lot valets this year. We have hot hands, um, so when they go out in the parking lot to help people come into church, they can keep their little fingers warm. And um, our, we really have, do appreciate these people because sometimes it's you know blizzard out there. But they help people come into the park, into the church from the parking lot, and um, we want to say thank you. I'll, I'll pass these out to the people that I do see, um, and if I don't see you, please come. They're in a little bag like this, and they're in the cabinet that is just out in the hallway there, down in the bottom part of the cabinet, and help yourself. Okay, thank you. Just to quickly expand upon what Roy said about next Sunday being Music Sunday, it's also our opportunity as a congregation to thank the many folks and their musical talents, because without that, service just wouldn't be the same. So with that, we always want to say thank you to those folks, whether you play, whether you sing, whether you lead, whatever you do as part of our music ministry. So again, thank you to all of you. Now, as we take a deep breath, let us prepare our minds, our hearts, and our souls as we worship our great God together.
Please rise in body or in spirit and join with me in the call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. May there be peace within our walls. We gather in prayer for the well-being of our community. May there be peace in our neighborhoods beyond these walls. We gather in hope for the flourishing of the city. Let us share now in the prayer of the day together. God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, God of the beginning and the end times, as we begin this journey through Advent and start a new year in our Christian story, we remember that your time is different from our time. May us stay awake and pay attention, because your peace is not our peace. And your ways are not our ways. We do not know the hour of the day when you are coming, but we know that we must be watchful for all the ways you will appear. Even as we remember this beginning, we know that you will be with us at the end. With peace, hope, joy, and love, we pray. Amen.
We invite our Advent wreath readers and our candle lighters to participate now in our first Sunday in Advent. not hurt or destroy on all my body holy mountain for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea on that day the root of Jesus shall stand as a signal to the peoples and the nations that shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious we are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of Women. Who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all the creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In these days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judas proclaiming, repent for the nation, kingdom of heaven has come. We light the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising toward God's promise. But we also light it as a sign to the world, an announcement there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We find as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. Thank you, Roger and Jeannie. Our call to confession today comes from Connections Worship Companion. Now is the time to wake from sleep, to cast off the shroud of sin and put on garment of grace. Let us trust in the promise of God's mercy, for the day of salvation is near. Let us join our voices together for the prayer of confession. God of the ages, through the prophets and apostles, you have challenged us to lay inside the works of destruction and prepare for your new creation. We confess that we continue to cling to our old sinful ways, greed and lust, absence and waste, envy and strife. Forgive us, Holy One, 
by the Spirit, lead us to live in a way that honors you, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is coming in the Lord. Amen. Please now take a moment to share your silent prayers of confession with our great God. Amen. Through the gift of baptism, we are cleansed in the Holy Spirit, clothed with righteousness of Christ, and covered by the grace of God. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our first reading this morning of the word comes from Isaiah. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The title of these verses is The Future House of God and shares the word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Hear now these words. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house that God of Jacob, that he may teach us ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords and their plowshares, and their spears into the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord, for this we give thanks to God.
Good morning. I'd like to have all the children come up and join me this morning. How dramatic a clock, yes. Let's see, where's 12? Oh, there it is. All right. This clock is one. When I was in school, one of the things that our teacher taught us was how to tell time, right? She had a big cardboard clock and would allow, you know, they would move the hands so that we could learn to tell time. So if I put the small hand on and the big hand on the 12, it's what time? Seven o'clock, that's right. And if I put the big hand on the five, the one, and the little hand on the nine, it's what? Nine oh five. That's right. Very good. So most of us don't use a clock like this anymore, right? We have digital clocks now, like on our cell phones, that just like have the numbers, right? Nine five zero is. 950, right? And this clock's even harder because it's got Roman numerals, huh? Yes, and the four is wrong. And the four is wrong. Wow. I didn't realize that. Okay. No, <laughs> didn't make it myself. I bought this in a store, believe it or not. Oh, that's right. It shouldn't be four eyes. It should be an I and a V. Very good. And you're right, James. Yep. Well, no matter what kind of clock we use, most of us look at it a lot during the day, right? We're always checking it to see what time it is. Suppose that your best friend was going to pick you up for a party at 2 o'clock, right? Uh, first, you would want to make sure you were dressed and ready to go, right? Couldn't be in your pajamas, I suppose. And then as the time grew near, you'd keep checking the clock and waiting for your friend to come right? If you know how to tell time, you would, you would probably check the clock every few minutes to see if it's time for your friend to show up. And there you go, yep. And, right, you would want to leave it quarter to two, right? So, so if, and if you didn't know how to tell time, you could just ask mom, what time is it? Is it two o'clock yet? So this Sunday marks the beginning of Advent. Does anybody know what Advent means? What? Advent to your house. Advent to your house. Well, that, uh, maybe. It's the first of four weeks before Christmas. That's right. It, it means the coming of something very important. Something very important is going to be coming. Christmas, which is when Jesus, birth. Jesus was born, right? So we're waiting for Jesus to come. And we're looking forward to that. Um, but we're also looking forward to a very important event as well. The return of Jesus. Jesus told us that he would come again. So he came many years ago on Christmas, right? But he told us he was going to come again. But he didn't tell us what time he would be here. Oh, no. In fact, he said, no one's going to know the day or the hour or the year that I'm going to come. Only the Father knows. Only God knows. And that's why we all need to be ready. You're guessing he's going to come again on Christmas? Could be. We don't know. Right? Wow. If we don't know when he's coming... How are we going to be ready? How do we know that we're going to need to be dressed and have our hair combed and ready to go? We don't need to do that? God loves us anyway. You're right. He does. But one thing we could do, there are some things we could do to be ready for when Jesus comes again. We could listen to our moms and dads when they ask us to do something. Well, Felix, we love Felix's head. And we could um, maybe help people, like our friends, if they need a helping hand. Or we could f maybe donate some food 
to feed people who don't have food, right? So there's lots of things we could do to get ready for when Jesus comes, even though we'd have no idea when that's going to be. We what if it was like that? That would be, uh, what number is that? That's a, that's a nine. So that would be uh, 945. Yeah, kind of interesting, huh? So all of the things that I just talked about getting ready for Jesus to come again are all the same things we should do to get ready for Christmas, right? So we should help others. We should feed others. We should clothe others. And now you're breaking my clock. That's okay. Come to think of it. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be worth it. it. No, it doesn't. It's, it's kind of old. Yeah. So, so do we know what we need to do for the next four weeks? Prepare. 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 That's right. Get, get ready for Jesus. Very good. All right, let's have a prayer. Are we ready? You repeat after me. Dear God, we look forward to the day when you return. Help us to live in such a way that we will be ready when you come. Amen. Thank you. All right, you guys. Is it good to go? You're welcome. Oh. supposed to have a day off on Sundays from school and Carrie makes some work, the poor kids. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Our gospel lesson today comes from Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. The necessity of watchfulness. But about that day and hour, no one knows, either the angels or heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So, too, will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken, and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day of the Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is our gospel lesson for today. Thanks be to God. Today, we begin our Advent journey, walking the road to Bethlehem with the prophets, with Mary and Joseph, with the angels and shepherds and all who follow Jesus. I have been thinking about the hope that this tiny new life brings to us today and every day, a new life that I imagine the Holy Family experienced in much the same way on that first Christmas morn. <coughs> to witness a new life coming into the world is to imagine limitless possibilities. When we have the great joy of holding a brand new baby in our arms, of welcoming them into the world, we cannot help but feel hope. Hope for what they will become one day. Hope for whom they will love and be loved by. Hope for the passions they will live out in their work and life. Hope for all they will teach us and all they will offer the world. For me, as each of my children emerged, and I experienced the sensation of time slowing down and narrowing into a tiny point that sparked with a life that, for me, filled the entire universe. God's essence, image, and love 
perfectly embodied in a tiny, precious child. Hope. This week, I've been longing for hope to emerge from the chaos of our collective life together. Three times in the last week, I've had to stop and take in another shooting that took innocent lives. I have wondered in anguish why we continue to do this to ourselves. <coughs> in our own city on Monday, a 12-year-old died from gun violence. In Virginia on Wednesday, six people died in a Walmart. A week ago in Colorado Springs, we witnessed again the fruits of our nurtured hate as five more people died at Club Q. If only those guns had been turned into plowshares. As a parent myself, as someone who has the joy of loving a member of the queer community, like many of you, I take these shootings particularly personally. What if my child had been in the bar that night? What if my child had been walking home on that Rochester sidewalk with his friend? What if on some other night in some other town, it is my child who is gunned down? Then I realize, of course, that they are all my children. They all are all our children. No matter how old or young, these lost ones belong to us too. This week, 12 more empty seats stood silently around tables where families hoped to gather to celebrate and connect. How many more empty seats before we cry enough? How long before we decide to act? <coughs> how long, oh Lord, how long? How long before we stop sending our thoughts and prayers to yet another community and instead act to turn guns and knives into plowshares and pruning hooks? It is hard to feel hope when things feel so hopeless. And yet it is into just such spaces of hopelessness that the prophets and Jesus proclaim the good news of the Hebrew scriptures and the gospels, reminding us that God's hope, the hope we are invited to cling to, is a hope that stands tall even in the darkest hour. Hope for Jesus' followers is not wishful thinking. It is not some imagined genie arriving to fulfill our dreams. Hope sets down its roots in the gritty ground of broken lives, desperate discouragement, deep chaos, and heartfelt anguish. This morning, we read the words of Isaiah from the second chapter of his book. It is a beautiful vision of the kind of life that God invites us into, <coughs> and indeed promises to create for us. Listening to the words, <coughs> I feel solace, comfort, peace, and hope. What is easy to forget is that these words follow an entire chapter that also begins in much the same way. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Only this first vision is one of chaos and destruction, hopelessness and pain. God is calling out God's people for their sinful ways, for bribery and ignoring the widows, for greed and failing to defend the orphans, for becoming estranged from God <coughs> and failing to follow God's ways. Aliens have devoured the land and they have been overthrown by foreigners. All is desolate. It is out of this desolation that Isaiah's vision for this morning proceeds. Let's listen again to Isaiah's word to the people. The word that Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Hope for Isaiah does not emerge from times of well-being and abundance. It emerges from a land that God has promised to forsake amidst a people upon whom God has turned God's back. For listeners of the first chapter, no hope remains except through full and deep repentance. And even then, who knows what destruction may surround them, whose life may be taken for refusing to return to God, which city or place of worship might be destroyed in recompense for the sins of God's people. Even if the people repent, will they live long enough to see the new life God promises them? Hope is one of the gifts God offers us when we rest our lives in our Creator. 
embracing the love and presence God gives us, and refusing to be moved from the certainty that, come what may, God's shalom will come to dwell in our communities. The hope that our faith offers us is resilient, persistent, even ridiculous in its unwillingness to be snuffed out. We witness this hope in the actions of the people who stopped the shooter at Club Q. Refusing to stand passively by while their lives were being snuffed out, it was not a good Samaritan with a gun who stopped this rampage. It was a trans woman in heels and a club patron who risked their own lives to protect the gathered community there. To run toward the danger requires more than courage. It requires hope and a belief somehow that our actions can make a difference. Even as we witness this continued violence, there are points of hope on which to focus. This week, I read the story of 25-year-old gun control activist and newly elected Congressman Maxwell Alejandro Frost. Frost was stirred to focus on this issue when he was only 15 years old, and he learned about the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook. He has dedicated his young life to making our nation safer. In a recent interview, he spoke about how he wants Congress to invest in programs to engage young people in music or boxing, anything to keep them out of trouble. Maybe, he thinks, he can find some bipartisan support for his ideas, even while Democrats are in the minority in the House. Indeed, don't we all agree that something must be done? Frost holds out hope that we can choose a different path forward. We can choose to work together for the common good. This work is not new. For almost a decade, evangelical Christian activist and author Shane Claiborne has been turning guns into garden tools with his partner in the project. Mennonite pastor turned to blacksmith, Michael Martin. Together they visit communities where they receive guns, disable them, and then invite the community to participate in turning their parts into garden tools. Claiborne speaks about the power of witnessing the relatives of those killed by gun violence, releasing their rage and sorrow as they pound a gun into a garden tool. He shared something about the experience in an interview I read. <coughs> Part of why we go to the forge and transform metal into guns, into plows, is that it's very difficult to argue with the kind of sacramental, and I don't use that word lightly, the kind of holy mystery of what happens when a man, who, a mom who has lost her kid, begins pounding on a gun and screaming at the top of her lungs. We've had police chiefs and Republicans and Democrats and gun owners and survivors of mass shootings that have all gathered at the forge to take the same hammer. There is deep power in this communal response to the brokenness we encounter in our communities. All these responsible responses, the drag queen and the patron, the young activist turned congressman, the groups turning guns into garden tools, occur in community, and they embody a hope that emerges from deep pain and brokenness. Just as Isaiah describes all of us going up the mountain to God's dwelling place so that God may teach us God's ways, we too draw closer to God and to God's vision of wholeness when we travel together. I imagine whole communities climbing that holy mountain, the young and the fit, the athletes and the differently abled, the wise ones whose bodies no longer move so easily, supported by the children who leap their way to the top, neighbors helping neighbors, the walkers sharing their food and resources, sworn enemies finding a common focus in reaching the top of the mountain and sharing their different ways of finding the path, all of them going up together. Hope, I think, is embodied in communities who work together not because they create a closed community where everyone thinks alike, but because they dare to actively face the hardships of life and engage with others who are different from them, who express different perspectives and different life experiences and embrace different ways of doing things. Hope enables us to be willing to lean into conflict and disagreement together, to be curious about what we can learn from one another, to be open to change and transformation. This is how we prepare for the journey up the mountain, and it is how we prepare for that moment that Jesus describes when he will return to us and the kingdom of God will be made fully manifest right here in our community. In our gospel reading today, Jesus shares his apocalyptic vision for the moment of his return. So often we get fixated on when this moment will be. We read the Bible for signs and we observe the world's troubles and we examine one another's beliefs and we predict who will be taken and who will be left behind. Wrong question, I can hear Jesus saying. This is not about the moment of Jesus' return, one he himself says no one can predict. This is about being ready as we go about our daily lives, being ready to encounter Jesus in every face, being ready to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, 
to give drink to the thirsty, being ready to welcome the stranger and visit the sick and imprisoned, being ready to share our resources rather than taking more than we need, being ready to see God's image in the face of the one who disagrees with us, who shames us, who triggers our rage or has been responsible for our pain, being ready to speak a truth to someone in power who has dismissed a person on the margins, being ready to hear the truth about our own mistakes and the injuries we may have caused, being ready to receive God's deep love, to accept being found by God, to cling to the hope God extends as a life jacket to pull us through the stormy seas of unpredictable and chaotic times. <coughs> being ready requires hope, I think. It requires a willingness to trust fully that God remains present, even in the worst days, that Jesus and the thriving life that cannot help but surround him will one day return, that in the meantime, if we follow Jesus' teaching, loving God and loving one another, we can catch glimpses of the promised kingdom, tiny moments of hope in a dark sky. Last week, while our group was enjoying some free time at Credo, one evening, a few of us donned the extra blankets from our bedrooms and ventured outdoors to watch the stars. As we gathered there on the road, someone began to sing, and we all joined in, gazing up into the heavens and singing quietly together. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down. Let's go down and come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Verse after verse we sang until just as the last words were given voice, good Lord, show me the way. We saw a giant falling star moving across the inky black sky. It was a magical moment, a sense of the Holy One blessing us in our desire to be shown the way, a beacon of hope and the mystical sense of the holy and sacred streaking across the sky to remind us of who and whose we are. As we enter this at time of Advent, this period of active waiting, let us look around for the hope God tucks into the corners of our lives, the promise to be present with us in the arms of our loved ones, the smiles of our friends, the compassion of our caregivers, the truthfulness of our mentors. Where is God calling us to go up the mountain together to learn God's ways and to become ourselves beacons of the hope God promises in the gift of a tiny baby come to love us all back to wholeness? Good Lord, show us the way. Amen.
Please join me in the affirmation of faith. We know our efforts cannot bring in kingdom's gun, but hope plunges us into struggle for victories over the evil that are possible now in the world, the church, and our individual lives. Hope gives us courage with energy to contend against all oppression, however invincible it may be seen, for the new world and the new humanity that is surely coming. Friends, it is now our time to pray together. After each petition of Lord in your mercy, please respond by saying, hear our prayer. We have a few additional prayers this morning. First from Janice Bilalabic. My sister Gloria had a stroke yesterday. From Tracy Vander, sister Eileen, an ICU after a heart attack. And from Susan John, happy 88th birthday to my mother in heaven. Thank you all for your prayers and support during this time of sorrow. Let us pray. Holy One, we ask you for wisdom and discernment as we enter a new day. Give us boldness and strength of heart, courage and wisdom to make today a better day than yesterday. Lord, in your mercy, we prayer. We pray this morning for the victims of the earthquake in Indonesia, which killed at least 162 people. Lord, in your mercy, we lift up all those who have been touched by violence, including especially the people who were injured or were killed at the Walmart shooting in Chesapeake, Virginia, where at least six people lost their lives. The people who were injured or killed at the Colorado Springs Club Q shooting, where five people lost their lives. And those who were murdered in Rochester this week, including Juan Lopez, and those who love these people, may your comfort and peace surround them. Lord, in your mercy. Also this morning, please remember the following people in our own community needing your prayers this week, including Janice Bilalabic, Sister Gloria, Tracy Vander, Sister-in-law Eileen, and Susan John's mom. Also, Alex McKeel, recovering from a broken foot. You may have noticed her wardrobe this morning. Kathy Wakeman's mom admitted to the hospital last week. Tom Ward's mom, Pat Tripoli, recovering from surgery and going to rehab. Julie Seide, recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Gary Dyke's uncle, Gary, recovering from a stroke and his parents who have COVID. And we continue our prayers for Buzz Bauman, John Belt, Sonia Davis, Debbie Schnabel, Hannah Walker, Angelica Alvarez's brother EJ, Janice Bilalabic's niece Tiana, Peter and Irene Derry, Fran and Bob Perrell's sister-in-law Patricia Withrow, Whit Beckett's brother Bob, Eric Paquin, Art Brooks, Ms. Carol Brown, and Bob Kaiser. We lift up the silent prayers in our hearts and the ones that you've already heard and are preparing an answer for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now share the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise now as you're able and comfortable in body and spirit? As we acknowledge our offering this morning by sharing together our offering prayer. Holy One, this Advent season will wait in hope, and we give in hope. Hope from your coming reign. Hope because of your presence with even now. Receive these generous offerings and use them for your work of healing and hope in the world. Amen. Amen to that. God calls our church to join the mission of Christ in service to the world. As we emerge in that mission, we bear witness to God's eternal reign. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. We go out to follow Jesus Christ in the world, to show and tell the good news of God to everyone. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Go in peace to love and follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.